Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, there are few issues on which there is more agreement internationally and nationally than about food waste. We all agree, for once, that this is something that needs to be tackled. We all agree that it needs a concerted action. And we also all agree that the magnitude of this problem is much greater than we expected it to be. And it's only in the last few years that it's dawned upon us that maybe a third or 40% of all the food produced is actually going to waste or is lost somewhere in the process. That created, in first instance, a moral outcry. An outcry about how it is possible that in a world of scarcity, where still so many people go hungry, we also waste food. But a moral appeal in this subject is not enough. We need to think about what to do. And what to do, fortunately, there is a lot to do. In fact, my speech today, and I hope also the attitude here in this whole conference, will be about the fantastic opportunities we have to solve this problem. A moral outcry is the beginning, but there's far more to do. And the main gist of what I want to share with you today is that we need to rethink our entire food chain. We need to think how we link production to consumption and all the steps in between. And how by rethinking our food chain we can actually solve this problem. We may not be able to really reach the goal of zero waste. There will always be a little waste. You know it yourself. When you empty the last package of something, there's always a little bit of food that remains at the bottom. But we can do so much better. And we actually can learn that also from nature, from the ecosystems in which we live. Because in nature, food waste does not exist. All waste becomes the food for another set of organisms. And this concept of recycling, of creating a circular economy, a bio-based economy, where all food losses in the end will turn into something else, actually is a very powerful regenerator of our economies. But let's think through those steps in the food chain. And let's take, for example, a small farmer somewhere in West Africa who grows peanuts. Her peanuts often go to waste, already on the land, but certainly after harvest, due to humidity, due to the fact that they're not well protected against rats, or due to the fact that there are all kinds of fungus, in insects or other pathogens, on the, uh, the peanuts. And these are actually, as you know, very, very dangerous. Her produce, already in so many ways wasting, is actually going to the cities. It will be shelled perhaps, and if it is reasonable quality, it may also be used for exportation. It will have to be sprayed somewhere along the line, but it may very well end up of a relatively poor quality in a consumer's home somewhere in the city. And there, because the quality was not good at the beginning, it goes further to waste. It may go to the chickens perhaps, or there may be something that's done with it, but not very much. How much can we improve that situation? The first step in the food chain really is the step of primary production, of producing vegetables, fruits, just basic crops, but also, of course, meat products, dairy products, and so on. In all these products, in great detail, we need to examine how we can improve and optimize productivity. Because food waste is actually land waste. If we don't get the optimum from the land, we waste the land, and we waste water, and we waste resources. So there's a very strong reason why food waste is intimately connected to production. The better the productivity, the less waste there will be in the end, because there's less risk for pathogens and other things to um, sort of attack the first produce. So optimizing the food production is a first step. And that also means, for example, in the animal production side, that we must look very carefully at veterinary uh, public health, making sure the animals are healthy. Because animals uh, that are healthy produce less waste, and their carcasses can actually be used for recycling. The second step in the food chain is, of course, deprocessing. So once it comes off the land, 
maybe it is stored for a while and the peanut farmer actually loses even more because her peanuts are not stored properly. It goes to processors and as you know processors are an enormously wide variety of people and companies. It's here that we have the first real step of the private sector if I just take away the fact that farmers also are private sector people. It is here that a concerted action needs to be taken to improve the quality of the processing. But the biggest losses do not occur so much in the processing. The more sophisticated the processing is, the better way we can guide the different streams of produce that come into it. A greater problem, of course, is at the level of the logistics moving produce around the world as we do so much at such enormous quantities and over such enormous distances is by definition a big loss during the way. The biggest losses actually occur in cold chains. Cold chains that either are too cold and therefore uh, reduce the quality, for example, of food and vegetables, or are not adequately set at a temperature needed so that we get actually the waste for example, of dairy products or of meat. But here's an interesting thing. When you think about the food production side and the processing and the transportation, there is an enormous amount of things we can do. And they have to do with the fine tuning of the whole food chain. Deciding the moment of harvesting, for example, apples and then putting them in a storage system that actually, for example, at the optimum temperature make sure that the apple ripens during the process means that fruits and vegetables that used to have to be transported immediately to the market can actually take a much longer time and still arrive at perfect maturity in the supermarket. The supermarkets are fourth step. We know now through our understanding of the chemistry of the ripening process of fruits and vegetables and the measuring of the adequate conditions which also have to do not just with temperature, humidity and so on, but also for example of the gases we use in the storage, that we can have an optimum use in that food chain and actually zero losses when it comes to apples and so on. This may be counterintuitive because we all think that if you take a fruit or a vegetable and you take it at the right moment, it must be ripe already. But it's a, it's a mistake. And most people, perhaps even you, as you go to the supermarkets, you don't realize that what you buy when you buy a fresh piece of produce, fruits and vegetables in particular, these are actually living organisms. They still need to breathe, they still have a metabolism. And it's by fine-tuning the metabolism during the processing and storage all the way down to the supermarket and the consumer that we get the least waste. And it is counterintuitive because when you see, for example, a supermarket with the vegetables packed in plastic, you often think, well, that's a bad thing, I don't want to have the plastic. But the plastic actually protects during the transportation and processing and up to the supermarket, actually, uh, the fruit or vegetable, and it creates an optimum environment to, where necessary, for example, reduce the metabolism and the breathing. So there's a lot we can do now with smart foils and smart chips that we, we add to containers so that we know exactly what the conditions are inside. And that has made a tremendous set of opportunities, created opportunities, for example, of fruits and vegetables from tropical countries to be shipped all around the world. The fourth step after my processes and transportation is, of course, the retailers. And they are varied as well. We have very large um, the supermarket chains and very small ones. And here again, it is interesting to see how the fine-tuning of the supply chain to the retailers can actually help to reduce food losses. Think, for example, a very simple uh, thing that you may not think of. If you have apples that are not uh, packed in plastic and they are next to other fruits and vegetables, apples are such enormous emitters of ethylene just also like bananas, that all the fruits and vegetables in that whole supermarket will actually start to ripen faster. So by packing the apples differently, you actually reduce the breathing of other fruits and vegetables and this may actually help to improve the whole quality and the shelf life of products. 
But there's far more that we can do. Increasing the shelf life, for example, of fresh fruit juices is now possible through new methods. Increasing the shelf life also in another very important way by looking again in supermarkets at the dates we have, the best buy date. It's often taken by consumers as the date by which it should be consumed, otherwise they should throw it out. That, you know, for many products is not the case for, um, say, rice or beans, uh, dry products, that's not a problem. But even if we extend the best buy date by, for example, two days, and we, we are still sure of the quality, we can, of course, measure that, it is possible to reduce the waste in these kinds of categories by about 80%. So there's a lot we can do, and certainly at the level of the supermarket, making it possible to use the waste or the unsold produce, of which, for example, Bread is one of the huge categories by using it um, either back into the food chain, for example, as animal feed, or to donate, donate it to food banks, can really be an initiative that needs to be promoted so that we uh, reduce the losses at that level very much. But then I come to the consumer. And as you probably know, at least in the OECD countries, 50% of all waste and losses occurs at the level of the individual consumers. And we can do so much better. It has to do with the, way, the behavior of consumers, often buying too much, often slowing out too much, having uh, their refrigeration, their fridges set at a, a too high temperature, uh, and also not knowing enough about the process of food production, <coughs> or food uh, preparation. Young people now think that cooking means putting something in a microwave. And seeing how you can, for example, reuse leftovers is, some, is a very important part that I believe we should teach young children at school. So the consumer is somebody who, of course, is confused. And we all are, aren't we, when we're standing in the supermarket. But the consumer can also by help, be helped by smart choices, by making it possible to choose the right things without having to think about it. So to put it differently, to sum it up, we really have a a chain from primary production through the processors, the retailers, the transportation, the logistics, the retailers, and the consumers. Every single part of that chain needs to be fine tuned. Some problems will only occur in poor countries, like especially the losses, say, to rats and insects at the first parts of the chain, and others have to be dealt with, particularly at the consumer level. In, other, in all countries, consumers are a key cornerstone of the strategy. But what the answer is, is a smart answer. It's we must move towards a smart food chain. And that is not expensive technology. The little chips that we can now have uh, in packaging, for example, that give you a sense of the quality and the, the real duration of the product are becoming cheaper by the year. And we can have them now in many, many countries. And many farmers, for example, in, in poor countries, even my poor, small um, peanut farmer, she can actually have a handheld device that tells her immediately what the humidity is of her stock. These things are becoming so easily available that we can make an enormous quantum jump in particular types of, sets, uh, of steps in the food chain. So there's a lot we can do. But it needs indeed, as all of us have said before, concerted action. Action by governments to ensure that the right legislation also on food safety is being enacted. Governments, of course, in an international arena so that we have the kinds of agreements that we make it possible indeed to reduce waste, but also to reuse waste, to think about restructuring economies so that they really become circular and bio-based economies. But it also requires the action of the private sector. And this is a good example where the private sector should actually surmount the different differences that there are and look at the concerted interest of all, that is to reduce food change. So it requires a real agreement at the level of the private sector federations. It also requires science. And this is, of course, my role here to plead for science. If I see what has been done in the few years since the first FEO report came out on food uh, waste, I think that has been tremendous. There's an enormous amount of work that still needs to be done. But the good news is that these are indeed solvable problems. And one day, 
our small farmer in West Africa will become a smart farmer and she will measure the humidity of her stock. She will be linked to the world market. She will understand where her produce goes. And the consumer at the other hand, say for example a middle class farmer, or sorry, middle class household somewhere in Vietnam will eat peanuts that may come from West Africa. And he or she in Vietnam can be as sure of the quality as any other consumer in the world. Because food quality and food safety are not prone to double standards. We must have one standard of safety for all. Science can help. Education is a must. Education also of simple things like food processing, food preparation and how to behave. Because in the end, ladies and gentlemen, food waste is also about nutritional waste. Good food means, and good food in the food chain means that it retains all the nutritional qualities. Those we eat poor food with poor quality also get fewer nutrients. So yes, we can do it. It needs a concerted action, it needs more knowledge, but I'm absolutely convinced with your experiences that we can make a big step forward this week and that maybe in 10 years time we can have halved this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lisa Fresco. And who could do better to set the scene uh, than Luisa Fresco? Again, with a very clear message about the chain, about action, and also, I think, a challenge that we are going to meet her in 10, year t 10 years' time and, and say, we not only could do it, we have done it. I think enough thoughts for a coffee break. And I think we need a coffee break, so I invite you uh, for a coffee break, tea, coffee, water, or some uh, soft drinks, and let's reconvene uh, at 11.20 sharp in this room. Then we have a very intriguing and interesting panel discussion with very eminent panelists. But let's have first a coffee break. We will reconvene in this room. 11.20 minutes. May I ask you to be sharp on time again so that we can start again at 11.20. Thank you so much. Thank you.